Cool, welcome back. My name is still Nick Horton. We are still at Green Impact Week. Today, we're, our focus is startups. I got three people on stage representing the university startup ecosystem, from uh, experienced folks to CEOs of incubators to students. I'll let them introduce themselves in a second. But we are looking at how we foster startups out of universities. One quick apology, you will notice Middle-aged white male, middle-aged white male, <laughs> young white male, young white male. This is obviously not what we had planned. However, last-minute telephone calls, something. Kids, apparently small children at the moment are getting infected all the time. So we've got a couple of cancellations. Ergo, I apologize for white men talking about diversity. <laughs> but <laughs> here we are. We're making the best of the situation. Hinek Sunagong, where are you from? How do you end up on stage? Where do, what do you work with? To start off, if you like to call me her, you I are can call you her. We that. can do that. But uh, that's just for, for you to do. My name is Henrik. I work at uh, Lund University and um, in I'm southern Sweden, in southern which Sweden, is just yes, an hour exactly. away. Exactly. So, so I'm also, as many others, a uh, great believer in the greater Copenhagen community and ecosystem. So, Forza. Cool. Forza. Uh, um, beyond that, uh, I'm working very much um, with the, or I've been working for the past five years within the EU system called EIT, European Institute for Innovation and Technology, which essentially is about um, yeah, startups, innovation, and uh, education. So, what we call the knowledge triangle. Before that, I've worked both at DTU, I have not worked at DCBS actually, but yep. in, in Aalborg, yep. but, but <laughs> elsewhere. I have a background also working a lot with tech initially and, and then moving into energy and now with a focus on food. Super. Andreas. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm, uh, I'm Andreas, the director of Copenhagen School of Entrepreneurship, uh, located at CBS. We uh, cater uh, and, and create the student entrepreneurship environment with approximately 260 new startups every year. Uh, it looks a little bit different here in the corona time. Uh, we are the entrepreneurship center of, of CPS, so we have everything from incubation, acceleration, but also more formal, non-formal educational activities. Cool. Nice. And Meld, yes, sorry, so take it away. <laughs> I was going to say, let me just, a quick word about it, just put this in it. CSE, you guys are, um, you guys are, so let's say, the Copenhagen Business School startup side, and so we got the Dan Technical University of Denmark, that we, we talked previously about hustlers, hackers, and hipsters. Yeah. And that stereotypes and generalizations often, yes. help, often help us along that the, 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 up at the DTU, the, the, they, they definitely produce an awful lot of hackers, and that you guys are always seen as the, the hustlers, mm. the people that can get mm. the things sold. Well, to go to one of the hustlers, we got Mel Tavano, who actually studies <laughs> at Co the Copenhagen Business School. Uh, you're the president of the Copenhagen Business School Climate Club. Boom. The organization with the long name. Um, cool. Thank you for the introduction and for uh, letting me join. Um, well, I'm uh, head of uh, the organization, CBS Climate Club, uh, which is an organization that we have built because we, we are developing the next generation of leaders in business. We are finding ways to together develop ourselves to become this uh, group of experts in sustainable business management. Uh, so that's what we do, and we have a lot of initiatives on the ground to do that, and also to impact uh, how we live, to live more sustainable and find ways to do that. Uh, so that's our perspective. That is, the, I guess, the next generation of hustlers. Uh, <laughs> cool, gonna absolutely. That? The hipsters, hustlers, and the hipsters, just for those of you that didn't catch that one, the hipsters know the product, know the, they know the problem. The hustlers build the solution, and mm. the the hips, sorry, the, the hipsters know the problem, know the, all the aspects of that. The hustlers sell. In case you're wondering what all the noise is outside, it's a football tournament. We cover all 17 FD, SDGs, and there is an inclusion diversity football tournament going on outside called Ombald. In case you thought there were enough football tournaments as it is with the Champions League, the Europa League, the et cetera, et cetera, and the European Championship coming up in a minute, good luck getting them to be quiet. Uh, we've got um, everybody on the social, you know, the, everybody from the homeless to various psychological issue groups. In any case, they are very enthusiastic. 
will manage. Kick it off, how do we get more green startups going? I'm pointing at you, Andreas, because you've got the hub. Uh, I think uh, we are all looking for, for that answer. I think, first of all, it's around creating a, a, a space that, that um, that cater to more than, than the old school look of we need a hub for hustlers, we need a hub for hackers, we need a hub for hipsters. So bringing you guys together? Oh my God, uh, I'd love to see a little know, bit more uh, of that. For, forever, CSE has been about not only CBS students, but all students from, from different backgrounds, profession academies, universities, etc. And, and of course, the easy answer is to see uh, the magic happens in, in the diversity teams. However, I also think we need to, if we want to transform the ecosystem, we need to transform ourselves first. And I think that journey we have, have started and have a lot of questions and unknowns. But what we see is also we need to stop having this uh, old school employability, business model canvas, lean startup focus that we have had for, for ages. We need to uh, adapt other things into that uh, system. Uh, we have a framework that we have started around that. Uh, we believe focusing on scalability, sus uh, sustainability, and the systemic view is, is the way to, to start uh, and, and trickle down into methods and practice, etc. And that, that is the learning journey we are on. If I could ask all of you, like, I love specifics, I love examples. You know, one of the reasons that we ended up with an awful lot of us feeling like we're being beaten to death with the, lean, the, the, can, the canvas is because it was an actual defined tool where you could see mm. a result. Where we often talk about results about you know, fostering entrepreneurship and, okay, how do you measure fostering entrepreneurship? Mm. You know, so, I mean, so some concrete things that you are doing to do things differently. Because there are a lot of people out there that every university has got this challenge mm. with their incubation, incubator, whatever they're calling it, their mm. initiative in this space regardless of size. So there's both the design criteria that is specific for us, and then there's the me methods that is way more difficult to grasp yeah. because there is not a canvas on sustainability and, and startups. There is the B Corp corporation set up, there is the future fit framework. There's so many different things going on. And we, of course, adapt to that and look what we can use. But I think we need to take two steps back and see, so how do we look at sustainability, uh, scalability, and, and this systemic view? Our belief is that we redefine all our programs with a clear focus on what is the profit element, the business old school classical element yeah. of our hub, what is the purpose element, what tools do we have there. Uh, we very quickly realized that we need to have many more things in than just a workshop or two about SDGs. Etc. Give us a, one example of things, things that you're cons considering or have brought in that's different? Uh, the, the value proposition uh, uh, workshop that we have had for ages has been adapted into to, to this um, uh, expanded view on what is the purpose. And that needs to be early on. And it sounds like something we have been doing for a long time. Mm, in that sense, yes, but the focus hasn't been right or the matureness of who we could bring in or how we perceive these elements hasn't been there yet. So I would see very concretely is designing it differently, having more early uh, workshops and, and tracks around um, psychology, psychology safety, uh, b b sustainability business models. Those elements need to be early on because they can very quickly pivot your business model or your view on what your product is. It's funny, I, mean, I work a lot with legal tech, I work a lot with the lawyers, and one of the things we talk about, just done a video a week ago with a professor from University of Copenhagen, who we haven't mentioned, they're often the hipsters. But uh, so we, we did a video on, uh, on founders' agreements, on the need for founders before they sign investment, before they, before they get a, aligning the founders' expectations and goals and visions and how they see things, aligning that at the very beginning. And the funny thing we see is, is that um, it's often that just having a, the need to write that down, making implicit knowledge is explicit. Yeah, there is a need for a lot of more work at the very, very early stages. Learn Europe, they do things differently in Europe, you know, and this is, we're, we're very Denmark, Copenhagen focused, greater Copenhagen. I mean, there is a lot of differences between, let's say, the outer regions, the Melmer side of the greater Copenhagen. They do things differently over there. What do you see different? <coughs> oh, it's, it's a very big question to, to answer, just general. I, I could rather say where, where what I, like to emphasize and, mm -hmm. and what I'm looking into and, and Andreas and I have previously also talked about that I really highly engage around the systemic elements 
that we have to look at the interconnectedness of activities. Maybe in that sense, uh, a Swedish thing about consensus, about uh, bringing all people on board. But I, I think there is a huge element of, of also advancing the understanding of entrepreneurs to, to think in within the ecosystem. Not that we, we have a lot of activities, especially from university, which is around uh, single point innovations. So, so put your things into a box and, and but, but the climate, the sustainability agenda, the, the transport agenda, it, it's so complex that we need to engage and, and integrate with other disciplines. So in that sense, it boils down to probably what we as old middle-aged men and women... Men in our prime <laughs> is the current term. Um, ...have experience with, that it's very much about relations. So, so one of the things that we're doing a lot is, is trying to establish relations with both the corporations, but also the startups, and, and trying to, to nurture this ecosystem of different perspectives. And, and then we should not underestimate, especially here in the sustainability agenda, that's also about um, public engagement. We, we can see, especially in the Nordic context, the public uh, stakeholders taking a huge responsibility. And, and there is actually a, a place for entrepreneurs also to engage there, in their if they are not just aiming for the profit alone, but also to the do good entrepreneurs. Yeah, and they're making money by doing good. I mean, there are, all right, a load of great points. I would just say the consensus thing, exactly. As a Dane watching the Swedes, they will talk forever, and they all seem to be saying the same thing, but what that, it seems like as a Dane, once you've worked with them long enough, what they are seeing is they are all telling each other we agree, and once they agree, they actually agree, where I think in Denmark, <laughs> We're really quick to, within a three-minute conversation, go, yeah, sounds cool, let's do it. And then ptoom, we run in seven different directions. Something else about Lund that I'd also love to talk, uh, bring, come work back in when you get later is your experience of uh, the campus. The campus at Lund is whoosh, spread out. <coughs> Lund is not like CBS is in the middle of Copenhagen. Lund is on the outskirts of a small town in the provinces. Super spread out, but what you also see is intermixed is, uh, especially with the innovation piece, is some really big companies like Sony, Axis, you know, cameras, a billion dollar company. There's you know, huge companies that have got, that are, they're almost on campus. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting things about Lund is, is that it actually is a campus city. Yeah. So, so it, it's, it's the university that ate a town. Exactly. So, so, so we, you, you find the university all over the place and, and you meet people all over the place. So in that sense, you, you, it's much more integrated. It's kind of yeah. this classical university campus understanding. DTU has elements of it. CBS is, is more, I mean, it's also scattered around yeah, Copenhagen, Copenhagen yeah. but, but it's not as big a part of yeah. the city as it is as in Copenhagen. CBS is part of Copenhagen. Yeah. Lund is part of Lund University, yeah. you could almost we, say. Yeah. We do, though, see in, in Lund also having small clusters, and, and, and we, we will see with, with the, um, the, the new institutions of, of the uh, large scale, um, what's it called? Oh, the, the large uh, collider there. Yeah, exactly. So, so we will see some, some hubs going up where, where they will have a specific science focus. Yeah, but, but otherwise everybody's kind of mixed together. Exactly, and which is very nice, actually. Uh, it's, got a, it's got an interesting effect. All right, so, Bang, so what do you see from the student side? Because we've got the, this is, how, this is how we're organized. What does it actually look like at the user end? What's the user experience of the entrepreneurship initiatives? I think, uh, I think there's a potential we could, we could be better at, uh, at leveraging, because I, uh, particularly also because I talk a lot with, uh, with students who are very uh, empowered in this field, particularly to find some way to save the world or make, uh, make an impact, to find a, a job that's purposeful. Um, and I think we have to involve them from a very early stage. And I think particularly, uh, I don't understand that, uh, why, why we don't have a lot of student jobs in small startups, because this is where you get a lot of different perspectives from people who are really engaged in this ah. field from a very, very young age. We just snap that one right there. I run a small startup, I run a business in startups. Some of the best stuff I've ever seen is students coming in and taking a, I looked at somebody once and said, on our way into a meeting, somebody said to me, we've got a new intern, can you give her something to do? And I turned to her and I said, yeah, can you analyze the service 
the professional service industry for me in Denmark, because I mean, the meeting we're in, we're talking about it, we don't have any numbers. How many big law firms are there? How many big accountancies? And what are the, you know, the big banks and the big IPR, company, uh, IPR agencies, intellectual property agencies? And she goes, uh-huh. I walk out of the meeting three hours later, and she's like, boom, here they are. And, what do you, and she had a couple of questions for me, zzz, 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 narrowed it in. It was amazing. The problem is matching, right? Is you've got this huge supply, there's a huge amount of people out, but you know, I'm busy doing about a million other things, including, because it's a startup, you know, washing the coffee pots. And then this is just one of these 70 things that I need, know I need to do that I'm not getting around to. And matching between, go. And, and uh, come over. Uh, we run this uh, internship in startup program, uh, which is very attractive for, for a lot of students. So how, how do I plug into that if I'm a startup? Uh, if you're a startup, you, you, you ad, uh, reach out to CSE. We, we don't need uh, startups in that sense because there's so many, so it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Not easy, it's, it's not difficult to find the match. What is difficult and what we need to be aware of, it's of course, it's a part of an educational track, formal educational uh, course, which yeah. means that we need to plug it into a formal system and we need the study boards, which is quite often the first big... Uh, uh, f um, what is that? What do those two, word means, two, two words mean to you? I'm a study board, I can think about it. Yeah, so, so in Denmark we have this uh, the, um, set up at universities that study boards, which is called Studien in, in, in Denmark. Ah, uh, okay, Danish. okay, okay. It, that is where you decide whether or not uh, courses are formally or, or not formally. So there's some sort of approval process exactly. for me as a startup it, to get give, access to your students. Does it give ECTS? And some study boards... ECTS credits? Yes, yeah, credits. Gotcha, okay. And then it's, of course, to combine the formal educational system with this more uh, non-formal learning environment that we represent. Uh, right. Quite a lot approve this. This is something that we are pushing for. And we are therefore also facilitating or curating this internship. However, we also see that if we don't, it can shoot in many yeah, directions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and quite a lot of startups in the past has also taken advantage of taking a lot of start, uh, internships. I've so, seen it done. I, so I actually I've think seen. we have managed to find a solution now where, right. where we have good hold in, in study boards and students and startups. And so if I so as a story, if I reach out to you, you've got a process. Yeah. Yeah, I would just um, I think there are two different two different solutions or two different things we can do. I guess you're talking about the internship, mm. but I was also thinking, I think that's a great opportunity for startups as well. But I was also thinking in terms of student jobs, mm. which is maybe a little bit easier to to do. There's not a lot of process. You basically just hire someone in. Totally. And I think. That creates a lot of value too, because in these small companies, you actually get to have hands-on experience mm. with stuff that you would never be allowed to touch in the big companies. Uh, you get to do the accounting, or you get to. Is this you guys? There was a there was a an event that Nikolai Haya used to run out at CBS called Startups Pitch to Students or something. Mm. Does that still run? Because that's that, I remember mm. that was insanely successful. I was thinking it was one of these things, it was so big, it was like, wow, when does this turn into a product all by itself? Or, but it, so start, actual startup paid and unpaid jobs where you're actually, do, it's not as part of your school, you're also looking for job jobs. Or for, yeah. like, something you can put on your CV. Mm. Definitely. I think there's a movement here in a good sense, and, and uh, I will match you up with, with a guy called Stefan that do impactful jobs, uh, mm. uh, because that is exactly the match he wants to try. Uh, the hub does it as well, Danske, Danske Banks, mm. uh, the hub. Um, we does it as well, Nicola Hoyer. There are so many actors within this field. It's about flipping it to become obvious for, for the engaged bottom-up uh, student movement as well. Uh, but that movement is, is really undergoing as well. No, I, I, I was just, while you were talking, reflecting a little bit about also, I mean, one thing is to, to emphasize and look into the startup scenes and, and yes, students and, and young entrepreneurs are, are open-minded. They are often very risk-willingly, or, or put differently, have less to, to lose and, and more sure. enthusiasm and just provide their time and energy within that. I like very much the ideas also, not only looking at collaborating with the, the startups, but also looking and trying to make the transparency to the larger corporations as well. So the efforts also being done at DTU around open entrepreneurship, trying to look also at the entrepreneurship. So, so how can we integrate, and, and I mean, you indicated that with 
Danske Bank and, and the Hub, etc. So, so there are different opportunities, but but one of the really big challenges, and I think Andreas actually indicated that, is is actually that we're looking at especially universities being the place where capacity building and great knowledge is created. It's also very traditional institutions with very very long time frames of of doing things. So so if you want to have a new education, it takes five, seven, eight years, it, the clock speed upon which especially tech companies is running is not concurring with, with the time horizons of the universities, which is a problem. Yeah. We, I was going to say, we, the culture at the universities, you're coming with a European perspective, love to dig in and then sort of, because you've got the eagle eye view and then here lower down. One of the challenges uh, that we've been banging on about for 50 years, a good 30 years since, you know, since the, the Stanford model of, of innovation started to become hot, of where if in American universities, at a lot of American universities, and especially, let's say, Stanford is one of the first people that did this, if you invent something, it belongs to you. Right? And their idea is, and it works out pretty well for places like Stanford, because if you walk around Stanford, everything's got a little brass plaque which says donated by and then a billionaire's name. And so that Stanford basically figured out, you know, if, we, if you go to school here and you go away, you invent something clever, you go away and you become a billionaire, you'll come back at some point and donate a new dormitory or a new concert hall or a new lecture hall. Uh, whereas in Europe, we've got this ongoing, and there's a battle on it going on about this on Twitter right now, which is that there's an awful lot of, um, you know, the, the university feels it owns the IP, which makes it incredibly difficult to monetize. Which is actually <laughs> one of the interesting aspects that the S Swedish system is different. Ah. There's still the um, inventor's right, so, so, so you okay. own your own IPR activities. I, I think yeah. one of the biggest mistakes that we probably made, but, but now it's becoming a little bit political, was the Hellier Center yeah. <laughs> model from, from invoice to, or from research oh, to right, invoice, right, yeah. where, where you actually try to institutionalize and orchestrate the whole IPR thing within the universities. As you said, with That's Stanford, like trying to organize jazz. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe that, but, but I like the example of, as you said, Stanford. I think Google is paying license fees to Stanford each year for two, three hundred thousand euro, uh, dollars, which is obviously a lot of money. They donate two hundred million dollars. Right. I'd rather take the two hundred million. Yeah, it's a bigger piece, it's a bigger cake. It's a bigger cake. So, so in that sense, yeah. I'm not certain that we're actually doing good by trying to, to keep IPR within the university context. But and I think, it's a very I just personal think the opinion. visuals, at, at when you go over to Lund and you see these big companies, and it is, and these are not like little, I mean, this is, you know, access, it was access cameras, whoever's, who's ever heard of it? Not very many people. It sold for $1.2 billion a couple of years ago. Came straight out of, you know, research there. You see these places all around the company. It's very but, campus. It's very visual. But it, but it actually also promotes another notion that that it helps people like me <laughs> in their what, what did you say, well arrived or middle age? Is it? Middle age, prime, prime of <laughs> prime, life. Prime, prime, prime. Thank you, yes. thank you. But saying that there is actually an incentive for all the researchers to do their own startups because they own the IPR and the own yeah. activities. Whereas I see in in more established. Um, researchers here in Copenhagen or in Denmark sometimes are more struggling. I mean, not yeah. all of them. There are obviously differences. But So, I mean, do you, of the people that come to you with good ideas and walk through the door and say, you know, I want to do a startup, how many of them are uh, researchers? You know, like, how much of it is research coming out of the lab into... Yeah. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers. But, uh, oh, good but, God. We're talking about like rough. Uh, I would say between 5 or 10 percent or something. All right. So... And uh, it is rather low, but it's also compared to how many students that are researchers, it's, sure. it's, it's fairly... Uh, we, we are part of open entrepreneurship, so open entrepreneurship is all on all the universities. And we, of course, focus on, on commercializing or spinning out research into to startup. And there is a movement going on here that is very much uh, pro this. However, there is the element of, of, of course, uh, we also have the tech transfer offices, etc. Right. At CBS, I'm, I'm not an expert because I don't think we have had a patent at CBS, at least not while I have been alive. Okay. So, so in that sense, it's, it's, it's a different kind of knowledge and different kind of spin-outs yeah. that, that we are looking into. One of my favorite courses that I've seen matched, um, 
man, had, had like X number of seats for CBS students and X number of seats for DTU students. Does that course still exist? Because I remember I was, I was part of a competition a while back, and I can remember that like out of, I think it was, maybe it was Venture Cup, but I remember it was like out of the, mm. the 10 finalists, seven of them had come out of one course mm, with wow. 400 students, you know? It was just nuts because it was such a fruitful mix. There, there is more and more of, of those kind. We both have it with, with KU, with uh, KADK. And, so and KU is the University of Copenhagen. Yeah. And, and uh, KADK is the art. Uh, All right, the design Kunst, Kunst yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, the hipsters. The, the hipsters. A lot of hipsters there. Uh, I, I like to talk about those three categories as capabilities rather than persons on, on universities because we, with, with over 20,000 students at CBS yeah, yeah, exactly. and 44,000 students at KU. So you're going to have a couple of geeks of course, in the mix is, and a couple of people with, with good taste. Uh, yeah. But, but um, we see more and more of, of those matches. I think the reason that there is not more of them currently is because of the, the legal setups. It's, it's very, DTU runs one kind of ECTS structure with study boards and CBS runs another one. So doing that click fit, that takes the five to eight years. That, mm. that's Sustainary, it. I see an interesting opportunity for us to introduce the DTU and CBS to each other. This is uh, excellent. There's a lot of that work that needs to be done. Cool, so, so there's a certain thing with the ECTS mix. Cool, but um, your take. When you talk, when you, the people that, the members of the CBS Climate Club are obviously mm -hmm. passionate about climate, passionate about change. How much technology do they, like, what, what, of the things they're thinking of doing, what are you seeing them do? And is how much technology is, research is going into that? I think uh, probably not so much, uh, to be honest. Uh, it is very much the commercial side of the story. Uh, but obviously that's uh, that's very good. A very important. But, uh, piece, right? yeah, yeah. but I think I have I've gotten some good ideas here. I think it would be interesting to work with some of the some of the guys from DTU as well because they are we are really developing into to the managers of sustainable business that can lead exactly these kind of diverse uh, startups. Um, Something another opportunity to tack into is mm -hmm. how about meeting the Swedes because I see the Swedes the Swedes tend to think bigger than we do in Denmark. You know, that, they, they make fun of us as, uh, you know, uh, but we are, Copenhagen is a very mercantile place. It's always been a trading country. The Swedes, they've got big industry. It's hard to find a small town in Sweden with, let's say, 15,000 inhabitants. doesn't have some international brand that was based there. You know, Ikea, Tetra Pak, Engelholm, this little place in the middle of nowhere, Koenigsegg sports cars. Oh, yeah, I've heard of them. Yeah, oh, this, you know, the, day, the Swedes, do the Swedes... Do you see a difference in how, in the thinking on scale and in perspective? <laughs> no, I, I think, I, I, yeah, obviously you can say there, there are these major brand, brands in, in Sweden that we all, or most of us know about, and, and also a lot of things coming up. There is obviously an entrepreneurial spirit in many of the small societies uh, in Sweden. Um, I, I'm, I have never done the analysis of <laughs> why and how that is. No, we're, so, so, we're not but, but I, academic I, numbers. What, but what, what I find, and, and to, to come back a little bit um, related to, to the, the tech and, and sustainability, I think it's also very much about um, the users, the, the, um, the actual, not, not only looking at the tech solutions, but, but also looking into who is going to utilize this. We see, for instance, in, um, in the food sector, Many technologies does exist. Yeah. It's about uh, changing habits, behavioral change, etc. So, so there's a lot of elements where, where we also have to look into the political context and, and the motivations and incentives around that. Take it away, gentlemen. Who's first? You were first. Go, go, yeah. Now, I was just thinking also about this, the thing we, when we were talking about Sweden. Uh, Sweden have been very, very good at uh, financing uh, new startups, uh, which I think we should definitely start to learn from from a political angle as well. Uh, and I think that is, of course, something we can't, uh, we can't find the exact solutions today, but this is something we have to dig into. How can we build a, a model uh, on innovation and investments from a political perspective in Denmark? Because I think we, we have the work to do to catch up to, uh, to Swedes in that matter. Yeah. And let's, let's turn it around as well. Sweden, Finland, they have been ahead of us in this entrepreneurial ecosystem for quite a while completely okay, uh, actually quite good, because we, have good, we can mirror ourselves in some of the elements and some not. 
Uh, in 2007, uh, CSE was founded, and I believe it was the first at the universities as an entrepreneurship hub. Now everybody at, yeah, yeah. Uh, has, has one. It's now over 13 years ago, which means we are now teenagers, and we are in our teenage years, and that's way more fun to be in the teenage years than an institutionalized, a bigger ecosystem where there is so many actors in the Swedish system where we still have an overview, and we have this naive teenage belief that now we can actually change the whole world to the better. So I actually like staying in that, uh, a little bit behind uh, early stage. Fast followers. I exact fast okay. fo uh, followers uh, way of, of, of being because there's so much is happening around us and, and we need to be much better at adapting. And that was the starting point as well. I don't, and we are able yeah. to do so. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there are enormous improvements. I, when I look at, uh, for example, DTU, that I used to go out and give a guest lecture to the entrepreneur class, entrepreneurship classes at DTU. And I mean, it started out in a you know, normal size auditorium. And I mean, when it finished, I was like, Good God, I couldn't see the back of the crowd. Mm. Then, the very last time I was out there, they had flipped the course. So it was no longer you know, people in suits showing up to talk to the kids. They recorded all the talks so the students would see the talks at home. And when they came into class, or when they met, it was to work interactively on teams, on actual hands-on products to learn by doing together and they've built a new facility for it on the campus, and you could see the money was being devoted for it. In entrepreneurship, 50% uh, or more than 50% of the students at the Technical University of Denmark now take entrepreneurship as a course. Mm. So I mean, from a small thing, and there are a lot of people, it's, it's a big school. Thousands of people are taking this every day. How they're dealing with the scale. How do you deal with, one, how do you deal with the scale, and, and uh, uh, and how do you deal with corporates? So I was thinking, like, you know, now that you've grown, because I remember, I mean, I remember when CSC was like one hall on one floor. 260 per year is like a mm. couple more. That's quite a lot, yeah. And how do you deal with the corporates? Because I was um, there in, in different ways, but developed. I also think we need to redefine how we, we interact with, with corporates. Because so what, would you, what would you like to see? Not so much what it is now, because that's a mi really mixed bag. Where would you like to go? There, there is still a great <laughs> scope. Sometimes it's, of course, about finding common ground where corporates are also helping funding that scale. Because being a part of a public institution, if you do really well, you have the same resources. So it, it, it's <laughs> yeah. the opposite of the entrepreneurial way of thinking. So, of course, we also need from philanthropic foundations, corporates and others to collaborate with some kind of financial support to kickstart it. That, that's one way where I definitely see a need and a value but, but I definitely also see it, we talked about internships or d many other kinds of, of settings where we could define that value creation a bit more clearly so it doesn't become about the corporate wanting talent with specific and therefore paying or whatever it could be, but actually going into some kind of strategic partnerships around internship, around, a, uh, you could say, a, a climate-focused fast track because they are also on a journey to figure out how does that look like in our organization. You've seen it done a bunch of different ways. What do you see, uh, let's say, for collaboration with the corporates? I think we, we uh, and, and, again, and again, and not to have to, and, you know, I'm not looking for one over the world, let's give us a couple of examples of stuff maybe that you've seen done smart that worked. What I'm currently, or I've been working on, and I must admit I'm, I'm a little bit off the startup scene, so, so yeah, yeah. I, I'm more into this uh, innovation. Entrepreneurship. Yeah, and, that's what, and what, corporate innovation is, I mean, what, what they bring I've, a huge um, amount of scale so they make change happen. Yeah. What, what I've seen is, is that uh, we, we have to also find the good balance and, and know our roles, so to say. And, and now here referring to, to some of the uh, works and projects that we're doing together with this uh, EIT food, um, where we see we have the commercial specialist within the corporations. And then they cherry picking and, and working very closely together with the researchers on a very specific niches around, for instance, juiciness of um, plant-based meats, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and finding the expertise. And, and what I really find fascinating is this: oh, that we are trying to create more transparency, that people easily go in and out and, and exchange and actually become part of, of the research team, and then withdraw, but with a with lot of inspiration and new ideas. So I would very much like to see, yeah, less boundaries between and, and more transparency and fluency 
in the navigation. We talk a lot about breaking down silos, and I think silos are really, really useful for storing a lot of stuff. You know, that, I mean, if you've got a lot of chemists, it's a really good idea that the chemists are really, really good at chemistry. It is also good that they can talk about chemistry to biologists, let alone to the business developers or to the marketeers. Yeah, I think the, the um, when I, it's funny, I've known about CSE forever, but actually, you saying that it's not just CBS is one of the first times I've clocked it, you know, that it's the Copenhagen School of Entrepreneurship and not the Copenhagen Business School. School of Entrepreneurship, yeah? And I was thinking about this, uh, this bringing more transparency, enabling more connections left and right. Yeah, but, but, but it's obviously a challenge, I mean, not, not to say, but, but if you're embedded into a curriculum where you have to do part of education and, and you get credits, et cetera, to, to take this course, the attractiveness of, of being there is for industries obviously often to, to look for talents, mm. as you said, but maybe not to find solutions. Yeah. in that space, uh, and, and yeah, maybe yeah. we have to find other instruments. This, that's a tantalizing uh, question to leave it on, which is, you know, yeah, exactly. Most of the engagement I've seen is really about getting the, uh, the, the brains that you want for your company, but getting the actual solutions. I get one last line, but I've been given the one-minute signal. So we get one last line on the potential okay. for fi also finding solutions at universities. Yeah, but I think that's, that was a really interesting point because, uh, because I think it's right. Uh, I've also been to these events and it, it is a lot about, okay, we want the best, keep the best people. Mm. But I think that that has to change with the green transition because that, that, that rule that, that the, the students uh, don't have the right solutions yet but are just talented, that, that is changing because the ones who know most about sustainability, they're actually the students, rather, not the corporate ones. Yeah, 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 that's a great point. Last words and last before mm -hmm. we wrap it up and go back to football. So, so uh, I definitely believe there's something here, but I think we should work on many layers. Of course, we should still have yeah, the yeah, talent yeah, focus. Yeah. We should also flip it around. We are looking into to something where it's also about the student teaching educators or researchers, student teaching uh, uh, corporate worlds. And then I, I think we need to crack, but this is a more governmental element as well. We need to crack how we invite corporate in the silo. Because I very much like that sometimes it's a silo. But, but we also have legal elements that we cannot invite corporates in and sit on campus and work for us for a longer period. And, and those elements will, I think, crack a lot because they will make the silo a bit more transparent. So we will still see what's in there and not just see uh, that there yeah. is a silo. Listen, we are, yeah. Uh, they are doing a little bit in Finland here, especially at Aalto University. I'm extremely cool. fascinated about. Mm. I think they have just said, and at which close their eyes for the Al legal elements. Also, Al all right. I think they have just closed their eyes and said, we do it anyway. I, I cannot really figure out how well, they let's have... See, let's see, they may also have gone in with... One of my heroes in life is Winnie the Pooh, who, when given a choice of an either or, said both. Mm. I think we'll Always. leave it there, yeah. exactly. Big deal, both. So anyway, well, mm -hmm. listen, I'm Nick Horton. Thank you very much to Henning, Andreas and Melde. We'll be back in a few. Thank you.